Thank you very much, uh, Ray. Great to hear the contributions of our industry partners and also great to have uh, Marcus live and kicking on uh, on the line. Uh, I already introduced you twice to the I audience, know. so I won't do that the third time uh, again. The only thing that, of course, I have to correct that is that uh, the square of my H index is not yours, but that was a little trick uh, for to see that where everybody was still online. <laughs> Marcus, um, we are we have a little time issue, but you have the next uh, 40 minutes. Then we are still really in the program. Sorry to short it a little bit short, but um, you know um, we are really looking forward to your contribution. So floor is all yours. Perfect. If you can share your content, Marcus, uh, please, I will be able to make it live for the audience. So sorry for the mess. Obviously, I'm not very good in electronics, but Microsoft Teams told me two twice that my account is cancelled. So obviously, I'm not allowed to communicate with Ireland. Yeah, but it, this gave me the chance to see your fantastic video twice. And indeed, it's a big honor to be a part of this initiative. And of course, I tried to prepare uh, something on sustainable materials. My typical opening is this one. This is, of course, is the planet. We only have one planet. And when these pictures should tell you something, it's indeed the incredible sensitivity of atmosphere and the ocean, as we just have heard. But if you look zoom in closer, you see the mess, which of course is not only perceived by uh, public opinion, but also by the people living there. We have more than 150 million tons of this plastic soup in the ocean, and it turns out a big problem. And in the very end, what you see is means that we have to change the material base and we have to change behavior and we have to do it in a clever way. Yeah, you can zoom in further and this is now closer to us. Yeah, close in the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, many seabirds and fishes die because they mistake plastic weight for food and of course after 200 grams of plastic weight the bird cannot fly but in the little pieces are even in the food chains or little animals take up the plastic weight this is so-called microplastic as fluorescence and by that in the very end it ends up on our table and this also means that we should change in the very end the way what we do with plastic yeah you can even lower and the lower you come the more serious the problem gets these are the so-called endocrine disruptors coming with our current uses of plastic, of, of course, cosmetics. And there's a little list on the top you have can read later, but practically every cosmetic, every household chemical, every baby bottle contains one of those. And this is something we have to change. It's guessed that in Germany that about uh, 50,000 young men will never have babies because in the very end, bisphenol A has disrupted their ability uh, to be fertile. So obviously there must be solutions, yeah. Of course, most prominent, and I love this diagram, this is the CO2 content in the atmosphere. This is the so-called climate change. COVID crisis is not in, I expect a dip, but the other dip indeed was the, the world economic crisis. And you see there was not even a significant devi deviation in the second derivative. What means in the very end that uh, it doesn't help to develop new products. It doesn't help to kill the mankind. We have to attack this problem completely differently. And this, of course, I will talk about. Yeah, this is an obvious solution. This is what I call the Greta answer. So we can, of course, stop everything. We can fear it, but this is not the opinion of a scientist. When I discuss with my young people, I send a letter to Greta. This is her stamp, by the way, she got from Sweden. Yeah. And I think it's good to protest, but it's better to change. Yeah. And if we want to devote the Friday for future, it's not a Friday of protest. It should be a Friday of education because in the very end you can learn to change something. Yeah. And this is better than protesting. Yeah. So we should really move from this position of profits of the dawn to scientific solutions and science offer these solutions. Some of them are very obvious. And of course, our generation, the elder generation, is able to teach at little, at least the beginnings. This is one of the things which is hardly known to mankind, and this is our carbon balance. And if you calculate the 415 ppm CO2 in the atmosphere, you integrate, you end up with about 870 gigatons, and this is an enorm enormous amount, of course. And we add every year, and this is easy to calculate, about 5 ppm, so we add 10 gigatons. Land biomass, is 550 gigatons, so it doesn't help to plant trees. 
Yeah, this is very nice and very good uh, to compensate on the outside, but this is not a real compensation. But if you look, for instance, into soil and soil only has 1500 gigatons, you see indeed that soil has twice the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and adding really only minor amounts of carbon to the soil can compensate for the whole CO2 increase. This is done by nature because this is called channel seam and we have fertile black soils. And if you look very carefully, you see indeed it's a tiny thin layer of carbon around 30 centimeter deep, which however carries the complete fertility. And already the Paris Convention, uh, Paris Climate Convention, there was a so-called five per thousand initiative, which tells us increase of humic black matter by five, four per, per thousand, four per mil will compensate the complete climate while bringing water safety and agricultural fertility at the same time. And this, of course, is an interesting starting point. And you ask yourself, how can we make now humic acid and maybe engineering humic acid? And there's a big inspiration, which is called blue carbon. Also, this is hardly known to anyone, but nature is able to do humification, which is a very slow and inefficient process. But mangroves do black humus with incredible speed. It's a combination of chemistry and microbia, and you can learn elemental steps and make, so to say, blue carbon in an engineering reactor in a chemistry way. And this is my material I will talk about first. It's artificial humus. Yeah. We can use biomass, of course, because to compensate these 10 gigatons, we ten need 10 cubic kilometers of carbon from biomass. But the planet is growing 120 cubic kilometers. And you can take this number as the principal ability of the planet to regenerate. Um, in principle, we can lower by 20 ppm every year just taking biomass. Yeah, and as 11% of biomass is already part of farming, farming cycles and 10% of them are thrown away as side products, this is exactly the base of our technology. So I take collected industrial biomass and make materials out of it. And it's incredibly cheap because waste is for free but even pulp wood is for about 30 euro or 30 dollars per ton. So this is a three cent per kilogram technology. Very unusual, of course, for typical discussions. How do, you, do we do that? We use an old technology invented over all five times in the history of engineering. It's in the very end, as biomass is wet, we do a hydrothermal process. So we cook biomass to very high temperatures. It's maybe around 180 degrees. And if you do so, you keep the complete carbon without metabolization in all the different products I list. This is monomers, polymers, carbon, and the efficiency, as I said, is one. And if you want to read it scientifically and not in farming practice, it's 1913 various, the Nobel laureate. Yeah. The idea is simple, a carbohydrate sugar is carbon and hydrate and the only th thing is you peel off water in water and like that it works very efficiently uh, you you end up with carbon where you started with a product rich in oxygen rich in hydrogen but the carbon is left but the good thing is it's not only a chemical synthesis it's a material synthesis and if, if you look now the different morphologies you can make you see very fine spherical particle this is a green printing ink you see carbon nanowires or nanotubes. This is a digit an electrical fleece or an insulation fleece. Or in the middle you see um, a sponge. And this sponge, of course, is good for exchange, for filtering, for membranes. So all the classical knowledge we developed with plastic bottles and all the plastic technologies, we now can apply on something made from biomass because it's just another polymer yeah, with different properties. Maybe the most probable polymer on Earth but a polymer. Yeah. Chemistry is simple. It's dehydration, as I told you. This is the so-called HMF. And from that, if you're a good polymer chemistry, it has double bonds and OH groups. You can make practically all polymers and nature is doing that throughout humification. This is, a, I would say, showcase synthesis. The little particles, we add another compound, acrylic acid, and then the particles are getting rough and they become at the same time a so-called ion exchange resin. And in the little diagram in the upper right, you see that this ion exchange resin is taking much more ions 
than, of course, a commercial ion exchange resin, which is due to the higher ion excite, so it's physical chemistry. But the price for this ion exchange resin is maybe 15 cents per kilogram, where you pay for a polystyrene sulfonate resin, which is on top, not sustainable, about 10 euro. So this is the real lever, and this makes, of course, industry very advert to such technology because you essentially reduce market values because by making everything simpler and sustainable, this is not exactly what a stock oriented company has to do. Another thing, and again, you see here an autoclave is the making of nanostructure. These are now carbon nanobubbles. It's done by template process. And I just showed you the little bubbles. So in the many diagrams, you see first the overview there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of bubbles. The size of the bubbles is about 200 nanometer, but the important thing is that they are hollow. And the hollow is, of course, good for storage of many things, but we use them as battery material because we can deposit metallic sodium inside the particles, and we, in the very end, end up, end up with a sodium battery, a very sustainable so and performing sust uh, sodium battery. Yeah, uh, But, of course, this is on the research state, we all only have such materials in the lab, so there are no electric cars driving with that because, of course, we are scientists. Yeah. A discussion we had 10 years ago was, is the engineering simple and does it indeed work with waste? Yeah. And even Germany, who is a super industrialized, super green country, has about 70 million tons of bio waste. So this is not little rapeseed straw. It's nothing you can eat. It's essentially a waste, and it comes, of course, from our biodiesel initiative. Wastewater sludges, well, we cannot remove them, but even funny things like orange peels are there. This is the orange juice we drink, and the peels, of course, are stored in Brazil, and there they cannot decompose, so this is special waste. Yeah, so we should indeed buy the oranges with the peels to make materials out of them. This is how such an engineering device looks like. We built one 10 years ago. It's a venture with the Max Planck Society. You see indeed that the reaction vessels are a little bigger. This is now 800 liters of an HTC product. And I have a little video, and this little video shows you one kilogram per second. So this machine in the very end of the size of the last garage can make one kilogram per second of the material I was describing. And this indeed is, of course, uh, what we want to do. We want to do, um, let's see, how can I get big again here? We want to do it on a scale to reasonable prices. I will talk now a little again about humus because a variation of this technology is making humus. And I told you artificial humus was invented five times ago. And one of these inventors were the so-called Terra Preta Indians. They lived in the Amazonas before indeed a virus disease came and emptied all of them. Yeah, but still nowadays, so it's a sustainable measure, you find the thermal settlements. And if you go there, you see what you see in the, uh, in, in the left picture, you see more than one meter 20 of Chernozeme. This is artificial man-made soil. And even after 500 years, corn is growing like hell, whereas of course jungle soil is drained by water and nothing is really growing on jungle soil once you have to remove the tree. Yeah, so obviously this is the way to do. And I, sh I love to show these pictures because these guys did it with a clay chemical reactor technology. So what you see in a digging site is a former reactor. It's a so-called double bubble reactor. It has the heads on the lower left side. They are uh, over pressure valves. So you know that they were using steam and hot water. And this pipe is a steam transfer pipe to exchange heat from the upper to the lower level of the of the reactor. We recalculated by kinetic constant a little the time it takes to for these reactions, and it takes six, six weeks instead of half an hour. But of course, these guys had more time than us, and I think it's an acceptable operation to make fertile soil in the jungle, which feeds the family. Yeah, that we are really touching a serious problem. You see at this map, this is the the, the agriculture organization of the United Nation. And where you ever see indeed a red spot, mostly of course in China, but also in the Sahel zone, but also of course in the zones where we 
co-wrote the whole Amazonas jungle. Yeah, we have a massive depletion of uh, here in the north of Poland. Yeah, a massive depletion of uh, carbon in the soil. And this is massive. And we, if we go on like then, China will have no food in 20 years. And they know. Yeah. So compensating technology for the quality of food while at the same time curing the atmosphere, of course, is something which looks like pleasant or acceptable. And this is indeed what we presented in China. And we have a big joint project there uh, enabling China in the very end to make these artificial humans. This is how they look like. And beyond that, I have to tell you that this is a very efficient buffer. So humus essentially buffers acid and base. It's a very good electro buffer. So this is about 30% of the capacity of a lithium ion battery. So if you want to know the biggest battery on Earth, it's indeed the 1500 gigatons of humans, which simply they are, oh, they are aerobic bacteria, they are anaerobic bacteria, and then to make them live together, they need a redox buffer. And this is created by nature by this wonderful material called artificial humus. Analytical data, and I have saved a little time, so in the very end, if you take the analytical stuff, you find hardly any difference to the synthetic stuff. You do by NMR, you do by IR, you do mostly by pyrolysis MS, Yeah, but it means really we do not see the difference and planting experiments do not show any differences. Yeah. This is another of my planting experiments. It's a private one. You know that I'm punk or rock and roll. Yeah, so after 10 years of the construction of our institute, we still see in the outside this uh, mass like landscape because Brandenburg soil is mostly sand and sand is incredibly hard to recultivate. So if you don't pay money for that and if you don't apply earth on it, it looks like after 10 years as shown in the left pictures. What we did is did we conjugated. It's a conjugation experiment. Yeah, uh, the humic acid to add. And you see indeed on the particles then with the roughness, a lot of things sticking on top. And this is, of course, is the where the water is bound. And if you go now th through typical agro engineering properties, you see first maybe the right side that the porosity of the material is about 20 percent. So it's not a condensed system. It has a pore system. Yeah. And then you look for the nutrient recovery. So you put on some nutrients. And you see indeed that artificial soil is so much better than uh, cultivated soil and only beaten by black soils. So let's for, take, for instance, nitrogen. 98% of nitrogen sprayed on sand is lost. Yeah. In artificial soils, it's 20%, but even in cultivated soil, it's 90%. And this is something we can change with polymers, with physical chemistry by creating, of course, the absorbance for the nitrates, for the phosphates, for the pot potassium. So this is nothing but physical chemistry, and this is indeed how effective it is. Yeah. One of the most unexpected things is indeed crystal design, because we found out that plants growing like hell even without phosphate fertilizer. And this is one of the old dilemmas of agriculture, that in the very end, the fertilizer remineralizes and every soil contains too much phosphate, but not available phosphate. So we made a model experiment, and this is indeed classical crystal design. Yeah, so go the A below. This is uh, iron phosphate. This is a crystal which cannot be metabolized by plants because uh, the solubility is too low. And then we added the humic acid to it and go slowly to see and you see instead of humic acid, you have a complete of the crystals, you have a completely disintegrated rough thing and the plants can eat it. So the humic acid in the very end etches or dissolves the crystal. Or go to the upper line, you see nanowires, you see nanoporous systems which are glued together clays. Yeah. So indeed it's obvious that such a soil is good for water uptake and the phosphate can be eaten. So it has a very heavy interaction of, of our polymer material with the minerals and presumably we can really go to green or bio gardening because we really don't have to add fertilizer. What we have to add is humic matter. It works by a reduction process, but I will jump over that. But this is what I like very much. 
because in China, and I said, I told you, the Chinese government is aware that they will die of hunger if they don't do anything. These, they do seedling experiments. This is corn seedlings. Yeah, and you have a control group, of course, which is fertilized and everything. So this is how the plant should look alike. And you see indeed on the very right side, the corn seedlings uh, with feed with iron phosphate. So something they cannot eat. Yeah, and the growth in the very end, but there you need numbers is better than with the control KPN fertilizer. Yeah, I will jump over that. This is indeed the vision of the future, and this is the industry we are cooperating with in Berlin. We go to in-farm, which means people can grow their salad in, uh, in vertical houses. The only thing you need indeed is soil and fertilizer. And of course, the market for such artificial soils, if you understand the polymer chemistry like that, is gigantic. In China, they think bigger. So they are dreaming of green cities, and one of them you already see. This is the upper left one. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the middle lower one is Singapore. They want to build that. This is a current construction site. And of course, you can imagine if you green skyscrapers in cities like that, first, how much carbon is bound. These are literally gigatons and how much, of course, the added biomass can help us to change the atmosphere. And this is the idea what I said at the beginning. It doesn't help to stop everything. We have to change, maybe in a very pleasant way even, the way we are running this planet. This planet is managed and we have to go to a more reasonable management. Yeah, so not stopping work on Fridays. Yeah, urban farming is a concept to come. Yeah, this is science fiction. But as we have young students, I hope then when I turn 100 in 40 years that I will start to see those things because of course this is the way to feed people with bio food locally. Yeah, and then we don't have to transport this stuff. We do a lot of chemistry because of course hydrothermal carbonization is just one aspect. Uh, we do more than only materials and only humic matter. Yeah, in the very end, it's another old idea that oil time is over, but of course we need platform chemicals, lactic acid, and all. Indeed, all can be in the very end based on biomass, but you have to go to other technologies. I already talked about no, the base cut. So anything which is left, by the way, which we cannot use, which is spoiled, you stand silk and fuel put in a biomass, in a biogas machine, or you of course make humic acid out of it. We know that we can harvest something, food or perfumes or medicaments, but in between there's an option for another 30% of all biomass, which is indeed overall in the world, exactly the amount of oil we spend at the moment, yeah, that, that we can do solvents with it. And this is, of course, from SAPI, a paper company. There are three components. We mostly focus on wood because we have a four gigaton wood production on the planet and about 2.5 gigatons of them are inefficiently used and thrown away. So we don't have to go anywhere because in paper factories already most of the stuff is there and we can take what they cannot use. Yeah. We use this technology. It's again water at high pressures and you tell me now this is an espresso machine and yes this is what we do. Because if you heat water to, to 18 bars, this is the optimal espresso. You can do win all the chemicals in, in such an espresso machine yeah, from the biomass by corresponding chemical engineering processes. These are molecules all in xylene, gamma butyrolactone. So many things are one shot away uh, from the biomass. And what I like very much is lactic acid generation. Lactic acid is a known product, polylactic acid, biodegradable plastic, but it's made by fermentation. And because of that, it's a factor of five more expensive than polypropylene. If you just heat biomass, yeah, you see the sugars, the cellulose is degrading in lactic acid automatically if you apply a base. So in 10 minutes of heating, you get in this set 30% of lactic acid in the product. And with the right catalysis, I cannot show you, it's even around 70%. And of course, this is a yield. And if you remember that cellulose is about 100 euro per ton, we can calculate lactic acid prices, which are well below, of course, fermentation. So this is where we have to go and what we have to invent. Yeah, here's a 57%. Yeah, 
There's a lot of chemistry behind, but I want to stop in five or ten minutes, so I have to rush up a little. Lignin, which is the glue of nature, and again, this is, I would say, a very attractive target for material chemistry, because as I said, we are currently having a cellulose industry of 400 million tons, and this cellulose industry throws away about the same 400 million tons of lignin because they cannot use it. It's a sticky, gluey stuff, is used glue. So what we do in the very end, again in water, we cook it down to monomers, and this is a very typical experiment after one of our reaction. The secret is already plotted in, it's called Ni NDC. So this is something very strange, but this catalyst hydrogenates the lignin completely down to monomers, and you see a typical 2D pink explosion plot of the monomers to use. Yeah, it's a straight shot. The secret is catalysis, and I will talk the last minutes about that. Yeah, why is that? If you do hydrogenations in petrochemistry, we are taking palladium, platinum, hydrogen, but neither platinum, of course, works with biomass. And the worst thing, we have to do everything in water. And hydrogenation, and sorry for the chemistry language, works via hydride and H minus. And of course, hydrides are not very popular in water. They will create explosions. So this is why water kills most catalysis. Yeah. Mother Nature is doing hydrogenations by an electron proton transfer. This is a very different mechanism. And if you ingest that in an enzyme like fashion, of course, then you can do a hydrogenation in water. Yeah. We do it for the students with a fun project. It's kitchen chemistry. So this complete project is done in an ordinary kitchen done with household chemicals. There's absolutely no chemistry involved. Of course, cooking is chemistry, but chemistry of the type you think is chemistry. So it's the ultimate consequence of green chemistry. I can do it from supermarket products in my kitchen. Yeah. This is the catalyst and you see two of my co-workers and it's a noodle machine. So we make a noodle duck and I have a video for that again for entertainment. This is how we make the catalyst. It's a machine for of 800 euro and you see it's just an Italian noodle machine with a chopper. And the chopper is generating our catalytic beads and then these beads of course have to be converted into the real catalyst. And it's done in, whoops, back to my talk. Sorry. Wow. It's done in a noodle machine, and this is how the catalyst look like. In the very end, this is how you make the materials. So I will stop the story here now. There are many things to do, but I think we can do so much under the premises of green chemistry and sustainability that we indeed can reinvent petrochemistry and come up with new products. The new products will be the old products, which are here phenols. And what you see here are pieces of Japanese or Chinese lacquer art. They already used plants to make exactly this stuff. And this, of course, is how the car coatings and uh, the plastic products of the future can look like. They will look like the natural products, but of course they are will be engineered materials done with the knowledge of chemistry, but based on the rules of sustainability. Jump, jump, jump. By the way, and this is funny, we also made redefined wood. Yeah, so we can make a wood which looks like wood, but is simply a remix of our lignin, best lignin, our cellulose, best cellulose, our best hemicellulose, so any, anything is optimized and not in a tree. So you see a typical object. This is a climbing wall. The test load on this piece is 70 kilograms, as you see. And if you go more mechanics, you see that this, by density and performance, is 10 times as good as ordinary wood. You have to go to IKEA now and tell them that the future shelf will be per factor of 10 lighter and at the same time sustainable. If I like it, they like it, I do not know. But the customers might like it because, of course, it's lighter and you can put much more on a thinner board because you have improved the material properties. Of course, it works with fiber orientation and missing porosity, so everything is well understood mechanical engineering. Okay, this is my rapid conclusion. I had to take up some time. 
what I was talking about. I was talking in the very end that we systematically, instead of oil, steel and semiconductors, want to use biomass as a starting product. And all our techniques are hydrothermals, they're cooking process in water yeah, at high temperatures and they allow us to make many funny things. And the maybe first and biggest success will be artificial humic matter because this is needed on the planet in gigatons and it will improve, of course, bioeconomy and bioagriculture because it seems that humic matter is the thing really missing in soil, not fertilizer. I haven't talked about engineering. This is the bright part. Yeah, but as I told you, we can also make new polymer signs, degradable polymers like that. And the good thing how it looks now, but this is maybe minus five years, is that they are cheaper than polypropylene and polyethylene. And if they're cheaper than polyethylene and propylene while having the same properties, innovation is simple because it's hard to convince people to pay more. Yeah, I had no time to talk about our real wood project. In the future, you might have a wood which looks like wood, is chemically wood, but by structure, no wood. Yeah, and it's indeed a superior material to wood. And you might know that the biggest airplane in the world was the so-called Spruce Goose by Howard Hughes. It was an airplane 100 meters in width. Yeah, and there's a very good chance that we can beat carbon plastic, reinforced plastic. Yeah, and that the future airplanes and uh, spaceships might be made of wood again because it's simply the material of choice. Yeah. I think we have a lot to do. We have to need partners. We need synthetic soil biology. We need terraforming as an engineering process. But if you're ready to manage indeed our planet instead of using it, I'm very positive for the future. My people doing that, they always smile, they're happy. Yeah, so I have no time to introduce them, but I will introduce this lady. This is the Greta of the antique, yeah, and it's Pandora and Pandora had a box and she was said not to open the box and she opened the box and everything bad on the planet came out. Yeah, what I tell you is open the box again because Pandora by with a second time found hope and I tell you we will find in this box science. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marcus. That was extremely inspiring. It was uh, extremely quick, so there was a lot of mind bubbling uh, science that you uh, that you shared with uh, with us. And um, I'm looking also forward to the opportunity when we all can travel again and when we can invite you over to uh, to the west coast of uh, of Ireland. So thank you very much for um, for the contribution. Um, I asked colleagues to put questions in the Q&A. I try to find those also. Well, I do have a mail address and of course we are in a special situation. I have to excuse again. Everyone is cordially invited to send me an email and I will try to answer. It's a big promise with 250 attendees. I know that this is the way to do it because Maybe it was also a little fast at the moment. <laughs> well, I can I can brief you that it was not uh, 250 attendees. We had on the stream over 20,000. Wow. So you may get a few emails. Uh, this is a difficult promise, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> that will keep you that will keep you busy. Um, I'm looking for the questions. Whether I'm, let's see whether I do the right thing now. No, I do not do the right thing. Um, there they are. I'm not quite sure that I'm seeing the questions at this moment. There must have been remarks and so on. That's well, okay. that is probably so my consciousness. Um, Luke, um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is John here. I'm just uh, reading one of the questions, Marcus. I yeah. think it's uh, how much does it cost to make the base cellulose from the base lignin? So say it again, I didn't get the last one. How, yeah, much how much does it cost to make the base cellulose from the base lignin? Ah, the separation. This is a standard process. So in the very end, you can use paper industry. There is a, a, a well-developed process. So usually uh, cellulose, which takes, so to say, is 80 cents per kilogram. So the expenses of the whole paper making as they only sell cellulose, but not lignin and not hemicellulose products is 80 cents per kilogram and they still make business with it. Yeah, 
if we really enter into streams and we take the hemicellulose stream and the lignin stream, which is at the moment, but just at the moment, because there's no use, very cheap. At eight, 80 uh, euro per kilogram, you can buy a ton of lignin. Yeah, uh, but this will not stay like that. I think the price to forward is around 250 euro for the lignin for a ton. OK, I think the question was, can you make it, uh, can it be used in the construction field? Is the ah, yes, this is this is one of our big things. Indeed, the future, we have a project on the future of ar architecture, and we think we can replace concrete by, indeed, artificial wood. So this is like fiberboard, of course, but it's a super wood, and the mechanical properties are 10 times better. So you know that wood constructions are very actual everywhere because wood binds CO2, whereas cementum generates CO2, and the numbers look quite favorable. You, of course, you have to go to numbers per part, but for instance, I can give you a few parts. So the typical thing, what we call a Sturz, this is the concrete part above a door. Yeah, they buy they sell it for 130 euro, and we can melt in melt inject it. This wood is melt formable, so by plastic extrusion, we can do it for 15 euro. Yeah, okay. and this is so usually it comes with a lot of savings. Maybe not everything will be indeed replaced, but at least uh, carrying and constructive parts are much cheaper. And we know all that wood construction is faster. Okay, Luke, are you, uh, can you see the quick Q&A now? Yeah, I can, I can, I can see them now. I was, uh, I had to expand my screen. I'm also looking a little bit at, um, at time. Um, there are two more questions that we, um, there are actually many more questions, but um, more about uh, the higher uh, value carbon materials from biomass. Can biocarbon outperform those expensive ones such as CNTs and graphene mm -hmm. in any area? So where's the upper limit? Yeah, no, this is, I would say, what we are really strong in, of course, make a graphene replacement out of biomass. And here, of course, as open processes are involved, we come, uh, graphene as a mineral is unbeatable uh, cheap. It's one euro per kilogram, yeah? So if you go to special functionalities, we have to do five to eight euro per kilogram. And for this, you have to find an application. Carbon nanotubes, super easy to beat. Single layer graphene, super easy to beat. But graphene as such is not to beat because it's a natural minimal mineral mined in China. And I've seen some of the mountains of graphene being there. They will even not be depleted. So we, we cannot beat uh, graphite, not graphene. Yeah, but single layer stuff, I think, will be certainly done in the future from biomass. Perfect. I see I see more questions, but I'm also conscious of time. Thank you so much for helping us also to catch up in the program such that, uh, you know, with a little bit of tweaking and flexibility, we uh, we are back on on schedule um, and we are inspired so uh, i think this was an, um, a nice conclusion of also the second um, international keynote um, address of this morning thank you very much again and hope to see you in limerick in uh, when the pandemic um, allows I so agree. and you have to hear the virtual applause of course in your mind uh, thank you very much thank you, <laughs> thank you very much uh, marcus so for all um, all that want to move to the parallel sessions, um, the links have been posted, I have seen. So you can just click through to your parallel session uh, that you wish, one of the four. And uh, at the end, there will be the closing when we go back to the conference hall, which is also just clicking through. So enjoy the next hour in the parallels and um, see you then back again. Thank you very much. Thank you.